Hello again, and uh, a literally a very warm welcome back to Aloha. If you were with me in the previous session, you'll know that uh, I've been enjoying a, a fairly pleasant autumnal afternoon here as we close the conference for 2020 with the final session, uh, the reflection on what we've heard in the last two days, and just some general closing discussions before we look, hopefully look ahead to uh, another conference next year. I should say, uh, first of all, just in case anyone has to leave earlier, could I just thank, on behalf of everybody who's been involved, could I just thank everybody uh, who has taken part and contributed in all the, the different ways, just in case I don't get a chance to do that uh, at the very end of the uh, proceedings. It's been a fantastic response in terms of uh, the experience we've had with the first time of managing the conference in this way. Uh, technically, we've been very fortunate, thanks to a lot of hard work. Things have worked really well. We've just a couple of glitches, which is perhaps understandable, but uh, it's largely been down to the contributions made by the speakers and by the participants as well through the questions and so on. And we'll follow all these points which haven't been answered, we'll do that in due course. So for the next 40 minutes or thereabouts, we'll aim to finish at four o'clock. Uh, I'm joined by three panellists. You all probably met them all before at some point. Uh, Russell Todd, Verity Smith and Joe Boardman. So to coin the current in phrase in broadcasting terms, colleagues, what's the takeaway from the conference? Verity. Oh gosh, uh, what a question to start with. Um, I, been, I This has been my first conference, so for me I've learned a huge amount, uh, met some new people um, in the past couple of days, um, and I would say a big takeaway from the conference is really um, networking and contacts. Um, actually there are a whole host of different places to, to look for those um, and to make those connections that really kind of cro cut across different um, areas of heritage I think I think a big point that's come out is that um sport actually um can be found in all kinds of different collections I was just in a session uh, where Claire Smith from the Metropolitan Police Heritage Museums uh, presented and I think once you start uncovering and start once you start working with those collections um you find that actually sport um is something that is universal um and is so entwined with social history from my perspective as a social historian that's kind of where I come at this um, and from a collections point of view and I think they're often a, you know they are often the starting point um, for understanding those wider stories. Russell you've been to a few conferences I'm, I'm sure over time they've, they've changed certainly the circumstances are different this time what do you take away from this one that is different from others perhaps? mentioned it in the opening bit of the the one I chaired a moment ago around community engagement I think the the, the level of resilience and imagination and uh, resourcefulness uh, I think has come through loud and clear um, I think as well what's important and, and, and people deserve a pat on the back for that and pat ourselves on the back and, and the rest of it and I you know, as I said I'm not a heritage professional in any in any way but um, I think one thing to, to bear in mind with that is that not let's not take that for granted or let's not kind of you know, not make, I'm not saying make a song and dance about it, that when we're talking to funders for, you know, stakeholders, um, you know, governments, you know, at all different levels is to, is, is to, is to be clear and to say, to say that that's the case. And I think there's, a, there's abundant proof of that that's come through over the last couple of days. Um, I think, uh, I think in terms of, yeah, looking back on when I went to the 2017 when up in Bradford as a, as a presenter, and I think I was probably until about three months before that, when I was asked to, to come along and do some stuff around podcasting, um, I don't think I'd, you know, I hadn't heard of the organization um, and, and just to see where it's come come in the last, in that time, um, I think is, is amazing really. So that's that's good. And, and there's, 
we, we couldn't get through all of the questions and all of the ideas and just the, the enthusiasm that was coming through in the panel, uh, the chat panel in, in that last community engagement one. So um, I closed it by sort of saying that um, it's an inherent sort of danger, necessary evil. You, you've already got a ton of work to do and these things just create more and more enthusiasm, more curiosity. But I guess that's a, that's a, a, a nice challenge, nice headache to have. But um, yeah, some positivity as well. I think that's, that's key. I mean, we reference that in the Gold Ball podcast we do with Catherine Field in. Um, and, uh, you know, she's been able to make some headway. Others have made reference to similar um, progress this uh, this year, you know, in light of what's been, you know, incredibly difficult circumstances. And it's going to continue to be really difficult. People have managed to maybe, um, you know, draw a sort of a silver line to, to those dark clouds, which I think is, uh, you know, is, is worth pointing out. You know, that's, that's nice. That's something that's a, that's a bit of positivity to things. It's a very important point, Joe. I think I, I've heard the word opportunity appearing far more than I would have thought I would have heard it appearing at the beginning of the con or coming into the yeah. conference. Yeah. It, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm am I've been amazed um, by the positivity that's come from this conference. And I mean, I've been to, to, to all, all the conferences and, and I think obviously we, we, were in, we were in our own new normal doing this digitally. Um, but some of the key points that, that have come out from me for, for me are uh, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I've heard that so much. And I think I, I said this in the hangout at lunchtime, we've got so much great practice going on within within the delegates of this conference that actually by sharing that um, and, and helping each other out, we can actually start to, to do new things and to develop new projects. Um, it's just unbelievable some of the things that people are doing. Communicate was another one that, that sort of came out as well, making sure that everybody communicates with each other, whether that's your staff team, whether that's your volunteers or whether that's with each other and partners. Um, and I think uh, there were a couple of quotes that, that resonated with me quite a bit, which was um, resilience has now become part of our everyday operations. And, and I think it has, but I think that's a good thing. Um, and and, and the, what, uh, a quote that I really liked, which is emerging from a couple of people, from, from Tim Bland from Heritage Fund and also um, Heather Lomas with Heather's, Heather's Still With Us. Um, I, they, they said, sporting heritage is not just about, and this was Heather's, balls, sticks and trophies, and Tim's was buildings or collections. It's about people. Um, and don't forget that, you know, that, that people are the things that, that make the sporting heritage. And I think that some, sometimes is, is, is not seen as, as, as the key, the, the, the key priority for organisations. Um, being flexible, everybody's been flexible. Everybody is looking to adapt now because they've got to in the new normal. But I think, again, the positivity um, and the opportunities that are out there now, because people are embracing digital and looking at digital as a positive thing um, to increase their audiences. Um, I think Vicky mentioned about, you know, um, making sure that you recognise the value of your digital audiences as well as your physical audiences. And actually by now embracing digital, we, we're, we're reaching that global audience. Um, so for me, yeah, that there's been so many um, positive things coming out of this conference, um, and I think that's come from the variety of individuals and organisations we've had as delegates, which which is great. It's great for sporting heritage. So with, with all this stuff, and that's a technical term, all this stuff that's going on, and all the change, and all the new things, and the, the adaptability, flexibility. Do you think? there's more we could do in terms of sharing best practice. You know, not every project is the same. It doesn't always work, but it, as do we have the right platform for sharing our experiences apart from the conference is fine, but now we've got all this technology, we could be using this much more often to share best practice or is it, which is the best format to deliver it? I think there's a variety of formats from my perspective. Um, I think when we do get out of, the, the lockdown that we're in and we can actually start to physically and feel more comfortable about physically meeting people I think that's great and I think there's always going to be the need for that because people like to meet people um, but I think actually these digital these digital conferences digital webinars um, or just informal sessions are really great as well so why can't we mix the two um, and I think as well because the delegates have come from so far afield Isabel's come from Australia it's fantastic so you know and she wouldn't have been able to come to a conference before because there were physical conferences. So from my perspective, I think we need to have a mix of the two um, so that we can try and embrace a, a as wider audience as possible. 
I would agree with that actually as well. Um, you thanks Joe for highlighting that. I think um, given that so many people have had to either cancel or adapt events this year that should have been in person, I think there is still the need for that because it's often those kind of conversations that you have around the edges, the more informal networking that you can kind of pick up some key contacts and some key tips. But um, I yeah, agree with Joe. I think um, if we can signpost people to the right digital resources, whether that's Google Sporting Code website, um, through things that will be circulated after this conference, um, that that equips people because yeah, as we've as we've all said, everybody's had to um, adapt to this new normal and it, it'll be a blended mix of working like this I think from from now on um, and we know it's not going away anytime soon um, and it, it's incredibly hard to predict the future at the moment so um, I think it's kind of making the most of, of what of what we have and and feeling comfortable to share that and I think I think people have been able to do that because there's been so much positivity and for, for me I felt really comfortable meeting a whole host of people that I've never met before in a, in a world I don't know too much about, but um, I'm coming at, everyone's coming at it from their own perspective. And I think that's a, a really positive thing. Russell, were you surprised uh, over the two days about how, um, I don't say there's little fear, but how funding actually doesn't seem to be an insurmountable problem at this stage? You know, it, it doesn't seem to be that that it's the big bogey. Everybody needs money and finance, but but the, the other issues are, are, are much more important now and the delivery. Uh, but the, the lack of finance doesn't seem to be stopping people being adaptable and resilient and inventive. Yeah, yeah I, I, it comes back to that word resourcefulness. I think it tends to be sort of within the sector anyway, and I've come to learn that, come to recognise that. It certainly is in my, my traditional background in community work, but it comes back to what Joe was saying. It's about people, and I think the minute... You put people front and center. I think most people would reject any kind of um, sort of um, uh, uh, you know financialization of, of of people and worth and things like that on a, on, a, on a much bigger philosoph philosophical level, obviously. But um, you know the, the the value of those interactions and you know spending time with with, with people and you know we were talking about engagement uh, in that last session, as I say, and um, and and, and uh, you know Darren was talking about you know putting things out to a public vote. So though we're not having the pop-ups and the open days and the things like that, there's still that desire to want to interact because I get the impression most people in heritage, they're quite sociable beings. I mean, they might be comfortable in in, in archives and down in the dusty kind of dungeons and, and all the rest of it, the basements, but you know, they, they love it when people show an interest in something. And and, and that I suppose that craving for that sort of interest, dare I say, attention, um, or, 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 or pricking that curiosity with people is is something that probably motivates them. I'm saying this, as I said, not as a heritage professional, but, you know, as an enthusiast, I suppose. Um, none of that requires money. Um, it, it, mm. it, it, it helps, obviously, but it's not that requiring, that, that, that fundamental requirement. I suppose if I did have a, a point of, a more sort of sobering point, I think, you know, I've got a podcast to, to, to edit, actually, with someone from a, the, the St. Melons estate in East of Cardiff around community work and how they've moved a lot of stuff online. And what we were talking about in part of that conversation is the lack of serendipities, though. So online is great if it's somebody's like Joe or like Fran is doing all the heavy lifting in terms of setting these things up and sending the codes out and helping people with the tech. Um, you know, the serendipities of being in, in the clubhouse, in the community centre, in the library, all that kind of stuff, walking the dog, whatever it might be. Those serendipities perhaps don't exist in the same way, clearly, on, on, online. So if there's ways in which we can design some of those in, and the lunchtime session was perhaps one of those, then um, then, then I think you can really maximise the, the benefits of these. Um, somebody else noticed in the comment about, you know, not having a, a pint in the bar with, with somebody. You know, that's yeah. those have been great moments in the last few conferences. If we can design those in, randomised coffee trials is a decent methodology, you know, just pick up random now out of a hat, you know, someone else in this conference today to have this virtual exchange with, um, rather than go to the person that's got that same interest or that similar job role, make it more random. And that, that I think perpetuates and, and stimulates those, uh, those serendipities. Joe, you were involved in that, is that workable? Um, yeah, it was interesting to hang out. We, we sort of didn't know what to expect, but it, it, it was really busy. I think we had about 35, 36 people there on, on the session. And it was just really just to get people to, to chat. And, 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 and people did, and it was about sharing that ex expertise and knowledge. Um, 
so I, I do think we we can we can try and do this mix and I think with regards to funding as well yeah one of the things that if we can we can use the lockdown the pos again spinning it on its head and trying to get some positives out of this is I think Vicky mentioned it in, in one of the first sessions is, 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 you know, using the time to to look at what it is that you've got, making sure you've got your plans in place, making sure you're being flexible and, and, and adaptable. And, and I think she quoted, you know, plan for the worst case scenario, because it can only get better after that. And I think if we can do things like that, because funding programmes will open again. So what I what we need to do is to make sure that we are in the best place possible yeah. when they do open so that when your application goes in and you're up against God knows how many other people, you've got the best application possible. And that's a mix of that passion of believing in your heritage project, but also understanding the dynamics and the procedural elements of, of, of application. So I think there's, there's, there's that element of preparedness for next year, but also using what you've learned this year to be more in in innovative. That was one of the questions in the Hangout, uh, you know, one of the, I think it was Alan, who was asking how they could be more innovative using digital to generate income. So I think, again, digital and trying to be innovative about how you do that and, and using that moving forward. So I don't think we can ever go back, and I don't think that's a bad thing, because I think we can use that and flip it on head, be positive, be constructive, and, and move forward. And, and now we can do a mix of, of, of everything. Um, and still keep the physical social, mix it with some digital stuff and, and, and hopefully moving forward, be able to access funding programmes, feeling a little bit more confident about the areas that we, we haven't been confident in. Can I just say, sorry to, to jump in, I think innovative, fine. I think there's a danger that in, in, innovative is interpreted as having to be brand new. You know, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute first. No, no, copy, no. imitate. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. You know, be, be the magpie, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, yeah. respectfully and copyright and all the rest of that, but but use what other yeah. people are doing as well. Yeah. So innovative can be relative as well. It's, it might yeah. be innovative for your sector, for your particular sport or whatever, but um, just go and just go and, because that's what we're all doing. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and carry on, I would argue. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at it. Sorry, Hugh, looking at Vicky's virtual tour was was phenomenal. And, you know, and, and, and the fact that people have wanted to share in this conference as well and have not been precious about, well, that's mine, you can't have it, which is brilliant because it, there's no point being like that. And I think that's the other thing is that everybody's willing to share. So, yeah, Russell, definitely take your point that, you know, let's, and I don't like the phrase, let's reinvent in the wheel, but let's not do that. <laughs> the, the, there's so many people out there and so many organisations out there that, that will be willing to share things. Raf Nicholson's making the point, and I yeah, accept entirely, that some people will miss out on a digital um, format, um, you know, if we go down that route, but the answer is a mix, be, to have some parts of, of everything done digitally and some other done mm. in real time, that that seems to be coming through quite strongly. It's not one or the other, it's a mix of both. And uh, Fran's reminding me that, uh, there are in fact some themed hand hangouts planned between now and Christmas, starting with a finance and funding effort with Joe on the 13th of November. Friday the 13th, Joe, I hesitate to remind you of that. So Always the, a positive. Always the a dates positive. are actually in the delegate packs and booking opens in early November, so there's a chance to pick up on, on that already. So. Uh, it's, it's a debate, but clearly there's a, there's a format beginning to develop that people are keen to engage in, in all sorts of things, not just the one kind of thing. So. Yeah. And, and, and there's a funding webinar as well, Hugh, which I don't know if Fran's raised with you. So as well as the Hangouts, there's also a more structured um, funding and income diversification webinar that I'm running as well. So if people are interested in that, I'm more than happy. Yeah, so the message is to, to, keep, to keep up to speed with what's on the website and in the various communications. Yeah. Sorry, on you go. I was just going to add to the conversation about a mix of digital and, and physical. I think Vicky made the point in, in the first session yesterday morning about um, that fear that if you've created something digital and virtual that no one's actually going to come to the physical um, museum or heritage site or whatever it may be. But actually they've found the opposite, um, obviously certainly pre um, COVID uh, and I think it's important to remember that that actually that can often ex ignite uh, people's interest and attract them and actually it's it's not either or hopefully it's um, 
see that online and then think, oh yes, I want to go and and see that in person. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think we should lose sight of that um, because yeah, as we've said, it's a balance of the two. In terms of where we are and where we're going, it, just looking at the lunchtime news and lockdowns and all the different changes clearly between now and, and next spring, it's going to be a challenging time for everybody. In terms of prioritising, where, where would you see us going individually or collectively in terms of core activity as against preparation for, for the new normal or whatever they want to call it? It's a tricky balance, isn't it, to try and divide your time between dealing with the here and now and even things like future applications and funds that might open in the new financial year or somewhere down the line. What advice would you give to projects and individuals, particularly individuals who are working away on their own? Coming at it from a freelance perspective and somebody working away on their own and you know, <laughs> kind of getting a, sometimes kind of think, oh, I wish I could get out of these four walls and <laughs> have, some, have some meetings in person. I think it's, if there's funding available it's it's grabbing that while you can i think and and if you can if you have got the time to apply if, if there are things that that's applicable to then then go for it because i think it's so hard to know beyond the end of this financial year actually what's going to be available um and that goes for across the cultural sector um i think um and in terms of activity i would say uh, and the sporting heritage is, is already doing this and i know there are things to come between now and the end of the year um, but just trying to maintain that um, digital engagement. Um, I know at this point in the year, everybody is feeling very um, fed up and quite fatigued. And um, yeah, it, it still takes a huge amount of effort to do a, a two day conference, whether you do that digitally or, or physically. Um, but I think being realistic about what you can maintain in terms of communication and, and engagement, especially between now and the spring when we know there'll be further lockdowns and restrictions um, we're into that already um, you know it's winter people won't be going out as much anyway um, so I think it's kind of making the most of the time um, being inside but not you know not piling on the pressure with, with people um, just because it's so hard to do that longer term planning I think. Yeah I think I, I, I'd echo what, what Rose is saying and I think it it goes back to what Russell was saying as well about there are so many people out there doing things that you can you can do and 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 do differently without actually having to start from scratch but also from from my perspective I from the fact that I mean I, I do a lot of work around organizational resilience so that that needs to be considered regardless of whether in we're in lockdown or, or not because I think if you don't have those foundations in place um, and you don't revise those foundations within the current situation, then you are going to struggle when we start to come out of things and, and, and funding gets, um, programmes get opened, or you're looking at investment from different organisations. So the one thing that I would say is make sure that you've got your plans, your strategies in place, and that they are reviewed, and that you do revise them, and that they are flexible and adaptable. Um, and, 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 and again, going back to, I think, you know, what, what, what Vicky said, you planning for the worst. So if you have these plans and strategies in place about, OK, the worst case, case, case scenario is this, um, and then actually you don't have that worst case scenario, then, that, then that's a positive. But it's, it's, from my perspective, make sure that you have done that due diligence and you've got that in place and that you're happy with it and that you are engaging with all your staff team. Um, including your volunteers, if you are predominantly volunteer-led, so that everybody knows what is happening and, and what you're doing, and and that you've got some of that preparedness ready for next year for when programmes are opening. I mean, that's what the emergency fund and the recovery fund was all about. It it, it was about helping organisations become internally robust, for want of a better phrase. Admittedly, over the shortest period of time that everybody's any you know everybody's ever seen. But at least it, it, it sort of gave everybody a little bit of breathing space that did access it and, and were successful. So it's about trying to put those in place. And you don't have to have war and peace in your plans. It, you know, they can be really simple. Um, a few sheets of A4 that just list what it is, what your operational priorities are and what your strategic priorities are. And the same with a, a fundraising or income diversification strategy. It doesn't have to be massive. Something that's practical and realistic that you can use. 
um, and keep on top of I social media has been my um, my my godsend over lockdown because I've been following every available organisation that I think has got information that's useful for me. So I if you know if if you are on Twitter or LinkedIn for me that sort of stuff be really useful um, because it's kept me up to date on policies and funds that have been coming out and things that have been happening um, across a range of different sectors. Well, the next part, part, part of the resilience work will be helped, no doubt, by the, the launch of the next phase of the Sport England project, which is going to, I know that it's going to help particularly set up the, the organisation in Scotland and a whole range of other things. One other topic, Russell, that's coming up quite a lot is the potential for crowdfunding and, and you know, crowdsourcing of different kinds. That seems to be a workable model now that, that people are finding quite beneficial. Yeah, I think it, it sort of riffs on that that sense that people want to align themselves with with campaigns and causes. Yeah. Um, you know, across all aspects of civil society, membership, traditional membership structures have, have fallen, whether that's, you know, trade unions, political parties, chapel, whatever. Um, and, um, and, and, and generalising a, a bit here and simplifying a little bit, but I think people are tend, to, tend to still be motivated by causes. And you've seen that with things like, you know, extension, Extinction Rebellion, certainly Black Lives Matters, Me Too, things like that. So, um, and social media, particularly what Joe was sort of saying then, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a massive sort of, uh, or an easy, not easy, it's a, short, it's a shortcut to, to, to reaching some of those. Um, and alliances then get build, built across some of these different kind of campaigns. Um, that motivation, I suppose, that, 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 that allows people to, or can be tapped into, that allows people to contribute as much as they can afford. And if that's, you know, a couple of quid, then it's a couple of quid. Um, if that happens to be, you know, a four-figure sum from somebody who, who, who can afford it and wants to, then, then, then so be it. And, um, you know, there's lots of um, there's lots of platforms now. I think you do have to do your work as well. That's something that might be for a, a little seminar, maybe an online seminar of this nature. Um, the more popular they get, you get some that perhaps are, are more or less benevolent, let's say. Um, but um, yeah, that that's definitely growing. But there's definitely there's definitely approach to take. Um, and I can remember a community centre up in uh, Glencore. If Darren's still with us, you'll know the area. Um, they um, Stephen Fry tweeted. This is about 10, 12 years ago. Tweeted about um, about a prawn sandwich, donating the cost of a prawn sandwich to their effort to get to the final bit. So they'd raised this amount. They just needed to get to that bit. Well, of course, as soon as he got involved, because he's Twitter royalty, <laughs> they smashed it. And you know, we can't all get Stephen Fry retweeting for us, but it's about being creative with with those sort of networks and things. And so maybe, you know, the clip that, for example, Dave showed in the last session, two minute, two and a half minute clip. Just send it, send it to everybody and everybody. Um, my friend successfully got a petition. The guy Jamie wrote this. He uh, emailed David Deans um, from Arsenal and I think the FA um, to get involved in the reinstation of that prison football team in the Gwent League because they had been, um, well, they'd been barred, let's say, um, on on some technicalities. That looks not going to stay there. Um, and you know, it's a massive, massive impact socially, emotionally, mentally for those prisoners. Part of the rehabilitation to be in that football team. Jamie was unashamedly, uh, Ian Wright was another one he got hold of. So, you know, use what you've got, get those clips out, because you don't know what benefit that's going to have a little bit further down the line as well. You mentioned shortcut. Uh, I suppose some people would say some of that might be, or that kind of work might be short term as well. But if you look at the impact of somebody like Marcus Rashford, for example, is the best mm -hmm. current example of sport being using a, a particular vehicle or a name or a label, um, on balance, it seems to be there are more positives than there are disadvantages to taking that that line. The short term thing doesn't bother me me personally so much about it, because there's always another opportunity further down the line. And that, that's an inherent danger with social media. Is it become it's that transience? It's 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 here today. Something else has grabbed your attention, you know, within within a couple of minutes. Um, but that's where I think, uh, you know, a, a, a team whether it's a press team or a comms team or it's care, for example, sport and heritage, being alert to these things and then kind of drawing them to people's attention is always, you know, is always helpful. Just leading on from that, I think what's useful with, with things like crowdfunding campaigns, because we've seen so many of them over lockdown. Um, in, in, in my neck of the woods in Sheffield, um, we've got a museum, we've got the video games museum, which was literally going to go under and they'd never done anything like this before. And they did a crowdfund, uh, crowdfunder and it, it was a short term um, 
project initially but now they, they've got so much funding that's come in that actually it's a long-term project for them now because of the amount of funding that that they've got coming in but also not only the financial which was brilliant because obviously that's why they set it up but the number of people that they've now engaged with and developed relationships with because of that crowdfunder has been phenomenal and I think that's one of the things that you've got to think about these things is it's about building those relationships I keep coming back to it. it's people buying people so you buy into something you buy into a person's passion and enthusiasm about about something because they believe in it and I think when you do that you can start to build those relationships and they and it becomes a more long-term relationship so don't you know don't forget that there are initially things might be short term but actually they can develop into long-term um, relationships and, and 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 positive outcomes as well Verity, yeah, really... sorry just a specific point Verity as somebody yeah. possibly newer to the whole mm -hmm. organization and the, and the activity we are a membership organization uh, becoming a member supports the work whether it's short term long term it's very important but, uh, that we all support each other and develop the membership what would you say to people or how would you uh, what would your recruiting gambit be if you were the head of recruitment for the <laughs> trip um, well I, I coming from a subject specialist network point of view um kind of shameless plug at this point for the social history curators group which i'm current chair of so having been a trustee of that for um over six years now um and understanding how a membership um organization works and in our case also a, a charity um, it's it, it's understanding from that point of view what can what can sporting heritage offer um, to somebody that is is new they might have joined this conference for the first time might be considering membership. Um, what are the what are the benefits to them? I suppose individually in terms of um, training and access to news and updates and those kind of things. Um, but also if they work within an organisation, what can they what new perspectives can they bring to the work that they do? Um, if they're engaging a bit further afield um, within their local communities in perhaps non-heritage settings, it's kind of crossing those, those boundaries. And then I think by that, by the nature of that, you kind of create those long-term relationships, a bit like um, Joe just said. Um, I was just gonna kind of follow on from that and say in a community engagement context. Um, if you're doing things like reminiscence sessions or so on, you build a you build a rapport and a relationship with local communities, um, and actually that's it, that's investment in so many different ways. And um, and hopefully those kind of sessions aren't just with you know older people who have um, had more experience or you know know the the longer history of a of a sports club, for example. Um, but you're kind of you're engaging with everybody around you it's that it's that people investment so I think it starts at an individual level um, but then it broadens out to an organizational level and then a community mm. level because actually members of this network can then go and share it with other people um, and it's creating those um, partnerships um, and I think that's why the research partnership session yesterday was was really crucial because actually you can find those contacts and relationships in different in different contexts. There's some good um, pointers appearing on the chat uh, which we'll capture on on various sources of funding <laughs> or how to fundraise not just the actual fundraising. Yeah. I just just in the last five minutes if I may I'm going to put all three of you on the spot um, if, and, and try and deflect you from COVID, uh, if, it, if that's at all possible. You know, if, if, if we were back have, in an ideal world where we're hopefully heading to Stirling next year, um, the dates to be confirmed, you know, within the changing circumstances, we should be round about now in Stirling. Where would you want to be individually in the work you're doing? And where do you think the sector should be or can be in a year's time. Go on, Russell. Because <laughs> I, I was going to come in actually. And yeah, I, 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 I know, and it, 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 it's related to that. I think is that you know, let's not engagement isn't a one-way process. It shouldn't be just be you know, let's go out, do some stuff out there with people, and then come back in and hunker down and, and, and whatever the physical metaphors are. Um, 
it should be an opportunity to, to put yourself out there and say, okay, what else, what else can we do? What else, what, what can we do better? What, what are we doing that's a bit, a bit naff? And, and that, that sort of, you know, selflessness, if you like, and that, and that, and it would be great if there is some examples of, uh, maybe in Sterling next year of presentations where we went out, we did this, we listened, we heard, and now we're doing this. And, and that, 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 that bit more of a, a two way uh, exchange. Um, I think that would be good. And that's when you start getting things like, you know, co-production, those sort of terms mm -hmm. happen, but it's also where you begin to leave a bit of yourself out there and to, yeah. and to really kind of, you know, try and embrace that, that risk. And it does feel scary. Don't get me wrong. And you mentioned about, you know, people who are working on their own and, and, and there's, you know, there's a lot of those, um, you know, literally at the moment in our own homes, but you know, there's a lot of people who've been working on their own anyway, <laughs> even in the best of times. Um, and it can be lonely and it can be quite exposing. And, uh, and so, yeah, put, put yourself out there. It'd be great to see a little bit more of that, I think, if, if, I, if I may. Um, and um, I think from a digital point of view, it'd be great to see not just, you know, I always like to think of it, this as a capacity building approach to take. You know, there's no point just paying people like me and others to come in and produce stuff for you. Go off and produce your own. And it'll be raw and it'll be a bit rubbish on occasions and all of that. All of that's part of the learning. All of that's part of the process. Um, and so, yeah, if we could maybe see some examples of other People, I mean, Andrew talked about it with, with uh, CC4 and Glamorgan, uh, for example, um, but maybe have another four or five of those to be able to, um, to, to to point to this time next year would be great as well, I think. Uh, and then I can pinch some of the content. Uh, I, I see Andrew Hignall, Santa Hignall, is offering you a <laughs> shirt for your Christmas. And we've all seen that, right? Yeah? <laughs> That's a commitment. No. <laughs> Cool. I, I'll, I'll just I'll just reiterate what what Russell said. To be honest, and and and, and especially on the things that things that are, make you scared, I I will hold my hands up now and do this to Fran for for the, what she's done with this conference and managing this conference. Um, purely because I know there are lots of bigger organisations out there that would never have considered putting in concurrent sessions mm -hmm. because of the complexity, and 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 we've done it, and and Fran's done it. Predominantly, we we just in building up building up the, um, the the conference content, and I think that fear. I was so scared about getting involved and doing the admin and doing this because I'd never done it before. But then you realise that the biggest fear factor is that invisible barrier because you don't know. And so I, I couldn't agree more with with Russell about yeah, it, it might be wrong, we might make a few mistakes, but the only way we're going to learn. And become better at things is by making those mistakes yeah. and and i think once we can realize that yeah best practice case studies are brilliant and let's have more of those and let's have more sharing but also let's tell each other when when things don't go right you know and and let's own up to it and say yeah do you know we did do that and it, it it didn't work so so we had to do this so actually recognizing that that things don't always go to plan and and don't always go right um but the final thing for me is, we as a sector, and I mean, I've been working in the, I've been working with charities and social enterprise for twenty years. Probably got more involved with heritage over the past four or five years. We don't shout about all the really, really good stuff we do, and and I think the pandemic. And sorry, I know you didn't want me to mention it, <laughs> has made us yeah. do that more. Yeah. Because we've had to shout. We've had to put our heads above the parapet because there are so many other people there. So we've had to fight through the white noise to say, hang on a minute, we'll do some really good stuff there. So I think we need to keep doing that. Yeah, and that, that's where opportunity has, for me, been one of the great themes. Uh, apart from the resilience, it's the opportunity to remodel and re readjust and, and move on. So um, final word to, uh, from you, Verity, before I make people blush um, and thank them all. <laughs> Yeah, I would just um, briefly um, echo the points that Russell and Joe have made. Um, yeah, the, the kind of previous point about engagement and so on, it's kind of, yeah, it's embedding practice for the long term and things not being um, tokenistic. It's creating those um, longer term relationships with people. I think it's right. Yeah, I think um, we don't shout about the good things um, that we do um, enough. I think it's been time in the last few months um, to reflect on that and think, yes, we need to be talking about all the positive things um, that we do and what we are good at um, but also having the confidence to take those risks um, because I think we're all going to have to do a lot more of that um, and certainly I think um, rather than seeing people or organisations in competition with each other it is it comes back to that um, those buzzwords of collaboration and 
an opportunity um, as well. So hopefully there can be a bit more of that and hopefully we can be together in a room in Stirling in 12 months time. Well, thank you very much for tying up the conference because that's a very neat way to finish it. We've only got about five minutes left, but that, that's, I think, been a, a productive round the houses, drawing some of the themes we've had uh, over the last two days together. And uh, always good to finish on a, a little bit of good news. Uh, I had confirmation this afternoon that uh, we've been successful in gaining funding to deliver a programme looking at neurodiversity and museums working alongside the British Golf Museum. So that's a good way to finish the week. Um, it's about embedding best practice, which is something we, we spoke about, and they're going to redevelop their gallery, and it's going to be dealing with, the, with autistic adults, which is a very specialised field, and then they'll share all that with the sporting heritage sector. So there's a very good example how issues like training and resources will they come forward from a, a new project. So that's a good way to finish it. So normally I would wish you all, uh, well, safe home, but I'm not going to because you're all at home anyway. Most of you, <laughs> it would appear. It's been a very fulfilling and enjoyable two days for me. I've um, enjoyed, I'll come back to Justine in a minute, but first of all, I think we, we're all due a, um, a virtual round of applause to the team who pulled all this together, who pulled it off indeed, uh, to Fran, who's worked so hard in the background and been communicating with all and sundry at all hours of the day and night, uh, to Joe as well for stepping in to cover Justine in the last couple of weeks. There's been an enormous amount of work and I think it's been very evident in the end product just how much has been done. And finally, as I said, to, um, to Justine, who's had um, an uncomfortable two weeks watching it all happen. Um, I've enjoyed being Justine for two weeks, but I'm, uh, um, well, for the two days anyway, not the two weeks, but I'm quite happy to hand over the reins. And as, as she pointed out to me before, uh, today, three years ago, the conference wasn't what it is now, uh, and it's largely due to the efforts of the team. So I think we thank them all. We thank the sponsors as well, Creative Core and Studio MB, for their help and support over the two days before and after the conference. It's been a pleasure to have them on board as well. So all that's left for me to do is go and support Scotland when we thrash Georgia at Murrayfield tonight. So uh, <laughs> we'll deal with Wales in due course in a couple of, in what, 10 days time or something, but uh, we'll, see. we'll see. We'll see. Right. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance, your contributions, and we look forward to Thank seeing you at the date to be in Stirling this time next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers.